there are some countries that most people know virtually nothing about. Places like Tajikistan, or Mexico, or the Kingdom of Gorilla City. But there are some historical nations people don't even know existed. From an island ruled by pirates, to the other Canada, here are 10 countries you didn't know existed. In the golden age of piracy, some pirates grew strong enough to start their own countries. So that's what they did on a small Caribbean island. The Pirate Republic was home to Blackbeard, Sam Bellamy and many other notorious pirates. They would attack any ship to sail close enough to their island, and so European leaders called them enemies of all mankind. Blackbeard was elected to lead them. He enforced their own set of laws known as the Pirate Code. The Republic was established in 1706, and as a haven for pirates, saw massive wealth flood in, but this left them without allies. To make it worse, pirates aren't good at running countries, they just aren't. So the British Empire took control of the island in 1718. They hanged every pirate to resist, but offered full pardons to those who immediately surrendered. The Taiping Rebellion was a massive Chinese civil war. It lasted from 1850 to 1871, and it's thought at least 20 million people died. It all began when a religious leader proclaimed himself the brother of Jesus Christ. He wanted China to be a Christian state, so after attracting a large following, carved out his own kingdom. The Taiping Heavenly Kingdom eventually controlled considerable territory and 30 million people. Private property was abolished along with social class, but the kingdom was isolated with Chinese forces eating away at its territory. With Western support, China crushed the kingdom in 1864. Shortly before its fall, their king died. His 14-year-old son succeeded him just in time to be brutally executed. Some estimates put the death toll to be 100 million. When I mention the Republic of Canada, you might think I'm talking about the modern nation of Canada, but I'm really talking about a little-known chapter of Canadian history. In 1837, armed uprisings took place in Canada. Rebels wanted various political reforms, some of which would materialize after their rebellion failed. Shortly before the uprisings were crushed, a group of 200 rebels fled to a tiny island near the American border. They were led by William Mackenzie. He declared the island an independent country. It was a republic that attracted hundreds of supporters with the promise of land and silver. He armed and trained these supporters, but the British Navy simply bombarded the island until they abandoned it. This ended the republic after just one month. Mackenzie fled to America and founded a newspaper. Before the rebellion, he was Toronto's first mayor. Napoleon was born on the island of Corsica. At the time, it was an independent republic known for resisting invaders and being pretty much ungovernable. But the year of his birth was when Corsica fell under French control. But being nationalistic and almost ungovernable, France lost control of Corsica during the French revolutions. A new leader of Corsica emerged. He asked the British for protection. They agreed on the condition Corsica would become a client state of Britain. The British king was their monarch, but their own government was elected. But many within Corsica wanted nothing less than full independence, which this clearly wasn't. In short, the kingdom was basically ungovernable, and so the British withdrew. The Anglo-Corsican kingdom fell in 1796 when France retook the island. It lasted just two years. Until 1868, Japan was not ruled by its emperor. Power was held by a position known as the Shogun, but then a massive war broke out. On one side, you had the Shogunate, who ruled Japan. On the other, forces wanting the emperor to regain power. The Shogun was defeated, and absolute power once again fell to the emperor. This is known as the Meiji Restoration, as the emperor was called Meiji. But something strange happened. Part of the Shogunate's forces fled to the large island of Idso. They declared an independent republic modeled on the United States. It was Japan's first democracy. Democracy. But with only a small military force and a handful of foreign advisors, imperial forces soon took the island. The Republic failed to gain international recognition and lasted just five months. They didn't really have time to do anything. With Japan now unified, the Emperor began to industrialize and expand military might. Japan was soon the first Asian country to industrialize. 
The Kingdom of Aksum was an ancient African state, with its capital a vital point in the Silk Road enormous wealth fueled the kingdom. It wasn't much of a military power, but this wealth brought them influence over surrounding powers. In fact, one Persian province called Aksum one of the four great powers of its age, with the others being Rome, Persia, and China. In the early days of Islam, Muslims fled to Aksum for protection as no surrounding kingdom could invade. Without this protection, Islam may not have survived. Ironically, it was the Islamic Empire whose expansion one day isolated Aksum economically. It fell into decline from then. Until 720, Spain was ruled by the Visigothic Kingdom, a successor state of Rome. But in the 8th century, North African Muslims invaded Spain and Portugal. They destroyed the kingdom and established their own state. But Christendom wasn't happy about Islamic rule in Spain, and after many centuries of war left only a small part of Spain under Muslim control. It was called the Emirate of Granada. As it held a vital port, the emirate flourished economically. Muslims from elsewhere in Spain fled here for safety, and its capital became Europe's largest city. But in the 1400s, other ports grew in importance and Granada declined economically. This was the first nail in Granada's coffin. The second was that Castile, a Spanish kingdom, was joining with and annexing its neighbours. It was only a matter of time until Castile came for Granada. After a lengthy war, the final and isolated Muslim rulers in Spain were exiled to Morocco, which was then called the Kingdom of Fez. We now look at the USA, the United States of Central America, which is what some incorrectly call the United Provinces of Central America. It was established in 1823 after the region gained independence from Spain, but disaster soon struck. The Mexican Empire annexed its northern provinces, and there was nothing they could do to resist their enormous neighbor. Luckily, Mexico became a republic in 1823, and the annexed provinces were given a choice to join Mexico or the independent provinces. They chose independence. So now the USA, as it definitely should not be called, was back together. But with so many ethnic groups, nationalism pulled the state into civil war. On top of that, they couldn't agree on basic issues like the abolition of slavery. And if you can't agree on slavery, you might as well part ways. The United Provinces fell apart, because obviously, Probably the most well-known on this list is the Golden Horde. It was a large segment of the Mongol Empire stretching from Central Asia to Eastern Europe. After the empire fell, it became independent. Being Mongols, they were terrifying. They invaded Russia and subjugated its people until Ivan the Gate freed them. Russians were forced into thick wooded areas for safety from the Horde, which is why a lot of Russian architecture seems inspired by acorns and things like that. The Golden Horde lasted two and a half centuries but was too big for its own good. With such different and distant tribes within the empire, the Horde tore itself apart. The Kingdom of the Isles was a collection of islands successfully invaded by Vikings. The kingdom was ruled by their descendants from the 9th to 13th centuries, but only some of that time were rulers not simply puppets of bigger kingdoms like Norway. At one point, Norway invaded and directly ruled the islands, but the islanders fought back, regaining independence. It was a relatively powerless kingdom that usually kept to itself, or at least that's why historians assume the historical record of the kingdom is incomplete. One thing we know is Norway and Scotland fought a war over who owned the Isles. Eventually, Scotland just paid Norway a lump sum for ownership of most of the kingdom. But Norway got to keep Orkney and Shetland, which today are both part of Scotland. So that's awkward. <laughs>